Um, as Trevani introduced, uh, there's kind of this myth out there, often that you know we see headlines, it's so hard to hire AI experts, there's such a shortage. Um, but really, I think the people you need are already in your org. Um, so I'm going to debunk several related myths today that make it seem that kind of AI is only for an elite few, when in reality, I think that all of us can be, can be using it in our orgs. Uh, as background, uh, this kind of grew out of my work as co-founder of FastAI, which is a nonprofit research lab trying to make AI more accessible. Our slogan is making neural nets uncool again, because being cool is about being exclusive, which is the opposite of what we want. We want to get a broader range of people from diverse backgrounds, all sorts of different domains around the world involved in AI. And we're especially interested in people with small data sets who can't afford much computational power, who may not think that they have the right background to even be doing AI, um, and that's, that's our focus. So we do this through a few different avenues. Uh, so we're best known for our course, Practical Deep Learning for Coders, which is available completely for free online. Over 200,000 students around the world have taken it. Um, however, we also have a software library, FastAI. It's open source, built on top of PyTorch, and it encodes a lot of best practices as well as state-of-the-art techniques. And it's intended to be useful, both uh, kind of beginner-friendly as well as useful for uh, researchers uh, pushing the state-of-the-art. And then we're, we're doing research on how do we make this technology easier to use and more accessible. And we have a robust community, uh, kind of both online and off. So the, the first myth about AI is that you have to have a PhD from Stanford. Um, and I'm going to share a few stories from our students today to kind of debunk these myths. Um, and note that most of our students are working professionals who took this course in their, their part time. Uh, so one is Melissa Fabros, and Melissa was a PhD student in English literature uh, focused on American poetry. And she decided to change careers. She's actually been my student twice. Uh, so many years ago, she decided to become a software engineer, and then later transitioned into being a data scientist and AI practitioner. For the past few years, she's been working at Kiva, which is a nonprofit micro lending platform that lets people around the world make and receive small loans. A typical loan recipient is someone like Elizabeth, pictured here, who's a Kenyan farmer who wanted a loan to purchase um, seeds and fertilizer. And Melissa discovered that computer vision uh, kind of APIs didn't do a very good job of recognizing Kiva users, since these computer, computer vision products were primarily created by and for white people, using uh, pictures of white people as the training images. And so Melissa won a grant and a competition from Crowdflower to create a more representative data set. Um, and this work occurred a few years ago. Another, uh, another story comes from Corey Spencer, who's a Canadian dairy farmer who wanted to learn AI to improve the health of his goat's udders. So this is apparently kind of the biggest issue in the dairy industry is udder infections, which can cause irreparable damage to the goat udder before they're detected. And so he, he did this uh, using heat sensors to pick up udder infections before they're uh, detectable to a human eye. He has spun this off in a company, EIO Diagnostics, and he has now moved on to robotic milkers for goats, which we already have for, for cows, but, but not for goats. Um, and I love this example because this is an application I never, ever would have thought of and really highlights the importance of having domain experts, so someone who really understood goat udders uh, using AI. Another, uh, another practitioner is Benson Mainye, who trained as a Kenyan microbiologist. And he noticed in the lab that scientists could spend hours staring through a microscope, uh, trying to identify the types of cells on a slide. He wanted to build a software classifier to do that uh, quickly and more accurately, and he did so. Sarada Lee was an Australian accountant that decided to change careers several years ago. She started a, kind of a small study group in her living room that's grown to be a group with over 1,000 members in Perth, Australia. And last year, she won a month-long hackathon in which the prize was a contract to continue working on the, uh, the project. And this was expanding solar power in Australia. 
And so I wrote about uh, these three students in a blog post earlier this year, as well as several others. Um, but there are a lot, a lot of applications for this, and people from all sorts of backgrounds are, are able to apply and use AI. Uh, so I mentioned before, we have this course. It's available completely for free. There are no ads. Um, the only prerequisite is one year of coding experience. And at the time we first released this three years ago, this was quite novel to not, uh, to not require any sort of graduate math background, yet still take people to the state of the art. And one of my frustrations that I found when I was getting into deep learning was that the materials were either too theoretical, and I do have a, a PhD in math, so even when I could understand the theory, it could be frustrating to not see the code and the practical applications, or um, some of the more practical tutorials were on kind of toy problems and didn't give you state-of-the-art results. Next myth is that you need, quote, big data. Um, and so big data was kind of a buzzword a few years ago. And I think in many ways it was very harmful because it emphasized the size, of the, the size of the data set above all else. Um, and just a little note about terminology. Uh, when I talk about deep learning, I'm referring to multi-layer neural networks. And this is kind of a particular family of algorithms where a lot of the concrete advances that we're hearing about in AI are coming from. Um, deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of AI. And I think AI is kind of such a broad term as to almost be meaningless. It's being applied to so many different things. Um, but most of what I'm talking about is all coming from deep learning. So two years ago, we had a student, after the first week of class, download uh, 30 pictures of people playing cricket or baseball, and that was enough to train a classifier. Um, so this is a much smaller data set than most people realize you could use. This was Nikhil Balaji who did this work. And the reason that this works is due to a technique called transfer learning. And the idea behind transfer learning is when you take a network that's been trained on a much larger data set, such as ImageNet, which includes, you know, tons of categories of different objects and animals and vehicles and household items. And then you can fine tune that network on your different and smaller data set, say something like chest x-rays. Um, the reason that this works is that the early layers of the network are often learning features that generalize across data sets. And in the case of computer vision, this can be learning you know, what a corner is or a circle. Um, it's not, transfer learning is not just for computer vision. It also works in fields like NLP. We've seen kind of a huge revolution in NLP in the last 18 months due to the application of transfer learning. Uh, an example from my uh, FastAI co-founder, Jeremy Howard, who previously founded Enlytic, which was the first uh, startup to apply deep learning to medicine. Uh, they, using just 1,000 CT scans from patients with cancer, were able to train a classifier that was better at detecting lung cancer than a, a panel of expert human radiologists. And it had both a better false positive rate and a better false negative rate. And again, 1,000 um, CT scans is a much smaller number than many people imagine you could use. Third, third myth is that this is just a fad. Yes, neural networks are big now, but you know, a few years ago it was SVMs. Who knows what it will be in the future? Uh, however, this is really coming out of a line of research that has been going on for decades. And so even though we're kind of just seeing you know, this wide-scale application of neural networks now, it's not actually a new, uh, a new area of study. And what's uh, kind of pretty amazing about it is, so this example is uh, showing how to create a breast cancer classifier using older techniques, uh, so not using deep learning. And in this example, uh, kind of a team including uh, the biologists as well as mathematicians and computer scientists were having to handcraft a huge number of features. And so I'll just read a few of these off. Relationships of contiguous epithelial regions with underlying nuclear objects relationships between epithelial nuclear neighbors, relationships between morphologically regular and irregular nuclei. So these were kind of some of the features that were going into a model. And you can imagine how difficult these were to create and how much expertise went into encoding those. And what makes uh, deep learning so powerful is that neural networks provide an infinitely flexible function. Um, so it's something that can really accommodate uh, huge variety of, uh, of spaces. Also, gradient descent gives us a fantastic um, technique for efficient parameter fitting. 
And then the reason that this is kind of working so great now, whereas in the 90s neural networks were, were less effective, is because of GPUs. Um, these are graphics processing units, the little chip that's inside of, uh, uh, or is used to render graphics for computer games or video games. All the advances kind of in gaming technology are also bearing fruits in neural networks uh, because they need the same type of calculation. Fourth myth is that uh, deep learning can replace domain experts or that, that there's not a need for domain expertise. In fact, I would argue that domain expertise is more valuable than ever. So we see a lot of examples from radiology. Um, and radiology is a neat field because there are, at this point, a number of radiologists who are medical doctors who have also gained a cross expertise in deep learning. And so someone um, shared this slide on Twitter of, you know, take this course to see why the, a different course, uh, why the network predicted a pneumothorax. And a uh, Fast AI alum who is also a radiologist and now a Kaggle winner tweeted, pneumothorax activation heat maps overlapping both diaphragms on an upright chest film, very unlikely. If there's no citation error, this is almost a proof of model overfitting. Um, I don't know what all of this means. I am not a medical doctor. And I wouldn't have known to say this. And this kind of highlights why it's important to have a domain expert closely checking the results and involved with the, the development of what's being built. Helena Saren uh, has decades of experience, both as an artist and as a computer programmer. And she's doing what I think is some of the most innovative um, AI-generated art out there right now. Uh, she trains exclusively on her own artwork. So she's uh, kind of creating the underlying artwork that she then trains the neural network, which she's able to program and fine tune. So she's kind of involved at all, uh, at all stages of the process. And she's doing some really beautiful and interesting work. Um, she gave a great interview with sharing that she also thinks that kind of bigger isn't necessarily better. Um, she also gave a fantastic keynote at IO Festival that you can find online. And something that she's, uh, she's made this analogy, kind of comparing uh, neural network generated art to other forms like Raikou pottery or printmaking, where the artist kind of has their skill and their, their expertise, but there's also this element of randomness in exactly what the, the output will look like. Um, and again, kind of having this cross expertise in uh, creating art through uh, non-neural network techniques and then enhancing it and changing it and doing new variations with neural networks is, is really neat. Um, and then this, uh, this point really applies to the stories uh, previously of how that expertise, whether it be in dairy farming or microbiology, really paid off when, when applying AI. Fifth myth is that you need expensive computing power to do this. We'll sometimes hear about studies coming out of Google that you need you know, $50 million worth of computers to replicate this. Uh, but that's not always the case. Uh, most practical real world projects that um, I know about require just one GPU. And you may already have a GPU you can use in your laptop. If not, you can rent one in the cloud for just uh, a few cents or 45 cents per hour. Um, so this is, this is more within reach than many people realize. I want to share a great uh, example from a student. I'll let you watch this. Um, Jason Antic created this as part of his Deoldify project. So he is adding color. He started off adding color to old pictures and now can add color to black and white movies. let this play for a little bit. You better get on the job. Some of the kids may be up this afternoon. Oh, Jack, we can get along without dragging those young kids up here. Oh, why don't you button up your lip? You're always squawking about something. You got more static than the radio. So I think this is, this is pretty amazing. You should definitely be following Jason, checking out his work at um, C-I-T-N-A-J is his Twitter handle. I'm adding color here. And I want to note, he did this with a single GPU. Um, so I think this is a fantastic example of what you, can, what you can do with one GPU. And also just a fantastic and fun work in general of, of adding color to, to old pictures and old movies. 
Another case study comes from last year. Stanford held a speed test called Dawn Bench. And the task was to train ImageNet to 94% accuracy as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible. A group of part-time Fast AI students entered, and they were competing against teams from Google and Intel that had access to way more resources than we did. Um, yet the Fast AI team uh, finished, this was in April 2018, with the lowest actual cost, the fastest on GPUs, fastest on a single machine, fastest on publicly available infrastructure, and faster than Intel's entry that used 128 machines. Um, so this was really, uh, really exciting work. At the time, uh, the, the entry that, uh, that beat them was Google uh, using TPUs, which were not publicly available at that time. Uh, this is tensor processing units. However, uh, the group came back in a few months later and released a version that was 40% faster than Google's work on TPUs. Um, and so this really, I think, is a, a strong illustration that it's not just about having the biggest comp uh, you know, computation center, the, the most expensive machines, but there's really value to kind of uh, innovating and doing things differently. Uh, this, uh, this was covered in The Verge and the MIT Tech Review. Jeremy wrote two great blog posts uh, for the Fast AI blog where he details a lot of the techniques, some of which are kind of surprisingly simple. For instance, uh, one idea he had that was very effective was starting with low resolution versions of pictures when you're first training, because those are smaller, so you can train quicker. You get the weights into a, a good ballpark and then upgrade to the high res versions. And so there are a number of ideas like that that are not particularly complex, but were new. People were not using them, and they were very effective. Um, so this is a quote from one of the posts Jeremy wrote about this competition. But innovation comes from doing things differently, not doing things bigger. And this is another benefit that people from different backgrounds bring, that you have different ways of thinking, uh, different experiences that you can contribute, and there's real value in that. And then the final myth is that uh, deep learning only works for very limited problems. It's probably gotten the most attention for its use in computer vision. Um, first, I'll say that some problems can be framed as computer vision problems that you wouldn't necessarily think. So this is work from a student, Gleb Esman, who is a security engineer at Splunk, and he wrote a great blog post about it. Uh, but he used uh, kind of behavior biometrics in deep learning to catch fraudsters. And here he has converted the biometrics into a picture. So these pictures are showing kind of where someone's moving their mouse, where they're stopping or clicking. And this was an effective technique. However, deep learning is not just for images or speech. It can also be applied to tabular data, so the type of data that you would have in an Excel spreadsheet or in a table. Um, I wrote a post about this here, and this is being used many different places um, uh, to look at also categorical data. There was a, a Kaggle competition on sales data from a German chain of uh, pharmacies where they uh, one of the teams very effectively used deep learning. And this was kind of typical sales data of, you know, like what were the sales each day? How long had it been since a holiday? How many miles away was the nearest competitor? And then I wanted to end with a kind of a fun video. Actually, I should... Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of context before I go into this. Uh, Jacques Maty uh, bought two tons of used Legos on eBay because apparently there's this very lucrative resale market for used Legos if you're willing to sort through them and find you know, the rare shapes and the, the particularly high value pieces. And so he built a machine uh, using deep learning to, to do this for him. So here's a video of it. First, it's having to kind of pick out, pick out the Legos, you know, a few at a time. <laughs> Send them down this ramp. <laughs> and then identify how to, how to appropriately sort them into the right bin. Um, and so I think that's a, a fun and creative example of, of using deep learning. And he's written a series of blog posts on his work that you can find. 
Um, and so I would, just, I would just emphasize that you and the people already working for you know about problems that nobody else knows about. Um, you're kind of intimately acquainted with the, the business problems that you're working on. You understand your data set and your, your users and your product, and this is really valuable. Um, yeah, so the AI experts you need are, are right beneath your, your nose. Um, thank you.